to welcome you all to our 2023 Big Spring Middle School Veterans Day Assembly. It's amazing to see our great turnout of veterans that we've had this year, uh, more than we've had since I've been here the past five years, so this is awesome. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, thank you for your service. I hope you appreciate what our students are going are gonna to do for you here in honor of this day for you. Um, we're going to start with our course, and then our band, and then we have a guest speaker, and then a short video. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. Please stand for the start of
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be transitioning to the band portion of things. As we're transitioning, I want to let you know that the band is going to be performing the marches of the armed forces. Uh, I know I probably don't need to make this announcement, but it's important to me to make the announcement that there are two branches that are not going to be recognized in this. It's the Special Forces March and the most uh, recent of the branches to be created, the Space Force March. So just in case there happens to be anybody in those branches, I apologize for their exclusion, but uh, we hear you, we see you too, we thank you so much for your service. So thank you so much, and here is uh, Marches of the Armed Forces. Of man for a tremendous performance. Uh, it's now, uh, this is a portion of the program where I normally introduce our guest speaker, uh, but this year I thought it'd be fitting to have someone else introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Brad Fickle. Uh, from the high school, the senior in high school, I have his son Ben Fickle here to introduce Mr. Brad Fickle and tell you about his military career. Here's Ben. Brian Fickle graduated from Big Spring High School in 1994 and enlisted in the Army Reserve the same year as an engineer. 
He graduated Dickinson College in 1998 with a BA in Policy Studies, where he was commissioned a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. He began his Army career as a quartermaster officer at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, serving as a platoon leader, bataillon staff officer, and aide-de-camp in a logistics unit. Then he served as a brigade staff officer in the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea, followed by a brigade staff and later command of an aerial delivery company in the 82nd Airborne Division. After company command, Fickle became a public affairs officer. In 2007, following public affairs training at Fort Meade, he served as a speechwriter and public affairs officer to a corps commander. He then served as a deputy division public affairs officer in the 82nd Airborne Division. Fickle advised then General Lloyd Austin in Iraq from 2008 to 2011, and again U.S. Central Command from 2013 to 2016. He served as a 3rd Infantry Division Public Affairs Officer from 2016 to 2018, deploying to Afghanistan from 17 to 18. In June 2022, Fickle retired as the Director of the Army Public Affairs Center located at Fort Meade, Maryland. Fickle's highest military education was at the United States Army War College, from where he holds a Master of Strategic Studies with a concentration in cybersecurity. Fickle is a senior parachutist and a parachute rigger. He was awarded the Legion of Merit, two Bronze Stars, and several other awards. His civilian education includes an MA in Management from Webster University and an MS in Public Relations and Corporate Communications from Georgetown University. Fickle is currently the Public Affairs Officer and Legislative Liaison at the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle and teaches graduate courses in Integrated Marketing Communications at West Virginia University. With Veterans Day coming up this weekend, I would encourage everyone to show their appreciation to a veteran simply by saying thank you. Now please welcome Brian Fickle to the stage. jump out of the airplane and landing in it. Um, I think we both agree that we would rather land on an army parachute than inside an Air Force aircraft. So I apologize for those jokes. Hey, so for the kids here, how many people in here are Travis Kelsey fans? How many Travis Kelsey fans? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of girls put their hands up. So keep your hands up. If you like, tra if you like Travis Kelsey, keep your hands up. How many of you like uh, Taylor Swift? <laughs> All right. And teachers, I apologize for uh, rousing the audience. Yeah. So I can't relate to this generation at all. I don't understand it. Somehow Taylor Swift got football fans, and somehow football fans became Taylor Swift fans. But I'm a Gen Xer. How many Gen Xers do we have in the room? Probably all the teachers, right? Gen X? So, um, for Gen X, what that means to the kids in the room, it's basically everybody that's your parents' age. We're Gen X. And the reason we're Gen X is, is because we grew up in the best decade ever, which was the 80s. Right? Yes. The 80s was the best. I know this because there's probably kids in this audience right now wearing shirts from the 80s. Guns N' Roses, or what do you have? Metallica, see? If you have an 80s shirt on, please stand and show your shirt. Please, I want to see your Metallica shirt. Yes, MTV. Were the, that was the best decade ever. Woo! All right. Well, I, I grew up in the 80s. I grew up in the 80s. I want to tell you about it, especially the ones wearing the shirt, so you know what you're wearing. The 80s. Uh, we grew up during the Cold War, and it, and it was about America, democracy, capitalism, football, fast food, and freedom against the evil Soviet Union and communism and tyranny. 
In elementary school, when I was in elementary school, we did regular duck and cover drills where we had to hide under our desks as a siren went off because we were practicing for nuclear war with the Soviet Union. The films we grew up with, the movies that we watched, captured our Cold War fears. I still remember watching movies like Red Dawn, where the Russians, I'm sorry, the Soviets were invading the United States. And of course, Top Gun, where Maverick seemed to face certain death, and his fighter jet outnumbered others deep in enemy territory. But with his skill, he defeated a faceless enemy of MiG fighter aircraft from the Soviet Union. And the audience cheered as he emerged bloodied and unbowed. Even our boxing movies when I was growing up talk, played on those Cold War fears. We had Rocky, who was played by Sylvester Stallone. He was a short guy, but his, his shorts were red, white, and blue, and he fought against this guy that was twice his size from the Soviet Union. And when it all looked hopeless, in the final round, Rocky rallied against all odds and the barrage of punches, and he put the red menace down on the, on the ground. We needed these larger-than-life heroes when we were growing up because they gave us hope. We were thrilled their triumphs. Over, um, we were thrilled about the triumph over long odds, and they seemed to embody America's fighting spirit. Corrupt tyranny could never extinguish life and freedom. Those action movies that we grew up with, with those valiant heroes beating long odds, fed our patriotic spirit during the tensions of the Cold War. And along with the rousing music on MTV and bold fashions like some of those shirts you're wearing now with fluorescent colors on them, they reminded us that communism could never extinguish America's shining light. Back in 1980, we had real life heroes too. And I remember watching in awe as a group of amateur college kids faced off against a Soviet hockey machine at the 1980 Olympics. That communist team seemed unbeatable. They had won six of the last seven um, gold medals in ice hockey. But as the improbable underdogs, the Americans clung to a slim lead in that final match. The crowd willed them on. You could hear chanting, USA, USA, with flags waving. And we found hope in the refusal to yield against a formidable foe like the communist hockey team. Just as time was running out, the impossible happened. The youths from America defeated the Soviets. If you lived through that moment, you remember the overwhelming euphoria of victory. The miracle on ice embodied everything we loved about the United States. Then a few years later, our president, President Reagan, stood at the Brandenburg Gate and boldly told the Soviet Union, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The economy was booming, blue jeans and rock and roll were cracking the Iron Curtain, and we entered the space age with the shuttle. The 80s, when I grew up, bred optimism and American defiance. We emerged from that decade confident that if we stayed true to ourselves, our best days still lie way ahead. And this is what defined me and my service. My parents were baby boomers. How many baby boomers do we have in the audience? I see some. Now the baby boomers, which is my parents' generation, they're often misunderstood. And sometimes they're the brunt of memes like, okay boomer, um, because they can't work their iPhone or something. But boomers were pivotal in driving so much of today's technology that we have today. And many answered the call to serve. In the 60s and 70s, boomers made up the bulk of the troops fighting in the jungles of Vietnam. Some volunteered out of duty, and others were drafted in an unpopular war. Regardless, over 58,000 gave their lives, and more names were etched on the Vietnam Memorial. But it was listening to the stories of my grandfather, who was from the greatest generation. Do we have any from the greatest generation here today? The greatest generation my grandfather lived in, um, he had the biggest influence on me joining the Army. My grandfather served at the very tail end of World War II, and then the Army Air Corps, which became the Air Force, and he guarded prisoners, and he built the first paved runway in Okinawa, Japan. 
What got me about my grandfather when I was growing up is he would tell me his stories about serving. And I saw how emotional he got when he would share those stories with me. And I saw how proud he was when he shared those stories. He only served a handful of years, but you could tell that they were probably the proudest years of his life. And it made me think, how could something that he only did for a couple years make him so proud that he would get that emotional? So when I turned 18, I enlisted in the Army. My parents wouldn't let me enlist when I was 17. And after I graduated college, I was commissioned as lieutenant and went to Fort Bragg. Two years after I got there, we were attacked by Al-Qaeda. The Twin Towers in New York collapsed and the Pentagon was hit. And I remember not going home for four days. We spent the next four days stringing up concertina wire around a base that's 50 miles in perimeter. And the first troops that would fight in Afghanistan came from Fort Bragg. My grandfather's generation was called the greatest generation because they grew up during the Great Depression. And after we were attacked by Japan at Pearl Harbor, they answered the call. Over 16 million Americans served during World War II. Throughout our long history, America has endured because generation after generation has taken up the torch to defend freedom no matter the cost. Since 1776, there have been 12 generations of Americans that have come of age in this country. And without exception, each one supplied patriots willing to serve when freedom required it. This unbroken chain started with the patriots of the American Revolution. It was the late colonial generation that declared independence and paid dearly to make it a reality. Just 40 years later, the compromised generation defended our freedoms against the British once more in the War of 1812. And though the White House itself was burned, America prevailed. In the bloodiest conflict on our land, the transcendental generation preserved the Union and helped fulfill the promise that all men are created equal. Over 600,000 died fighting fellow countrymen in the Civil War. Later in 1898, to aid Cuba's struggle for independence, the Gilded Generation fought Spain. And though it was just a short war for America, it came at a cost. The missionary generation answered the call to make the world safe for democracy in World War I. New deadly technologies made victory in Europe devastatingly costly. And then America's generation defeated tyranny in World War II. Over 16 million Americans fought, with hundreds of thousands laying down their lives on distant shores. The silent generation was far from silent with over 30,000 dying in the often forgotten Korean War and many more fighting communism spread in Vietnam. My parents, the baby boomers, saw over 58,000 of their generation perish in the jungles of Vietnam. Again, those names were memorialized on that somber black wall in Washington, D.C. And then Generation X answered the call when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, driving his forces out in under 100 hours. Today, the millennial generation is carrying the torch. Now, a new generation comes of age in a divided and dangerous world. Our progress is never guaranteed, but America endures because its citizens heed freedom's call over and over. In our nation's nearly 250 years, there have only been 12 generations of Americans, and in that short time, our democratic experiment has already faced several direct threats to its survival. Every time our adversaries underestimated the resolve of the American people. In the Revolutionary War, our fledgling nation fought against the world's greatest army for independence. British General Charles Cornwallis stood on our shores and said to George Washington about his army, Your militia, sir, is nothing but a mob. He underestimated our desire for freedom, and we prevailed. When the British invaded again in the War of 1812 and burned our White House, they doubted our fortitude, but we rallied to defend the homeland and we prevailed. After years of bloody civil war, the Union was preserved. And before the attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, Imperial Japanese Navy Admiral Yamamoto incorrectly said to the Emperor, we are sure to win hands down if we act promptly and decisively. After America was caught off guard and declared war in Japan, Yamamoto then correctly said, 
I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. And on 9-11, when terror struck at the very heart of our nation, they once again underestimated American resilience. Each time America has been challenged, adversaries have failed to grasp the strength of our ideals and citizens' unwavering devotion to this nation conceived in liberty. And while the future will surely hold new tests for this democratic experiment, we can take courage from generations of patriots who proved freedom's light could not be extinguished. Against long odds, America has always prevailed. In closing, on this Veterans Day, I am humbled and grateful to stand before you in this auditorium as part of the long line of patriots who have served this nation since its founding. To our veterans, families, and all who support them, thank you. May we live our lives in a way that honors your courage and commitment. I also want to recognize our committed educators here today. You have the important task of teaching our youth about the ideals and citizen virtues that veterans risk everything to defend. As we raise up new generations of involved citizens and leaders, America's future rests in your hands. And as a big spring bulldog, and as a family of bulldogs, I am so very proud of our teachers and administrators in this school district. Thank you for being a big part of the lives of my children, who I didn't know would be here today. God bless America's veterans, and God bless the United States of America. to our students. We now have a video of photos that students have sent in of family members. Some are here today, some are not able to be here, but family members who are veterans or are currently serving, students were able to submit a photo of them, and our staff put them with uh, some news about the video, so here we go.